Alhamdulillah. You know, when we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that praise, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Alhamdulillah fills up the heavens and the earth with light. It's something very easy for us to say. And we've been entrusted to say. But the words, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, they belong to Allah. Nobody can praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised Himself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created His angels. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us one time, he was hanging out with the Sahaba, he pointed to the sky. He said, the entire sky is creaking. You know when you walk on old wood, wooden floors, foot floor creaks. He said, the entire sky is the Samawat, all of it, it's creaking. They said, why is that, Ya Rasulullah? He said, because there's not a four fingers width, except that there's an angel standing there, or bowing down, or making such that, glorifying and praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all over the cosmos. And the Prophet ﷺ described to us that their praise of Allah, it's continuous, right? They don't need to take breaks, they don't eat food, they don't need to go to the bathroom, they don't have other family issues, they're created solely to worship Allah. And they say in the Quran, وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ This is their purpose. So they're glorifying and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from before creation existed, from before the heavens and the earth existed. All the, when the angels were created, they were worshiping Allah from that time until the end of time. And continuous. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the trumpet is blown, and all living things start to die one by one by one, and their souls are being snatched from them, these angels that have spent eternity praising Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, their final words of praise is, Ya Allah, we cannot praise you the way you deserve to be praised. Ya Allah, we cannot praise you the way you deserve to be praised. Allahu Akbar. No matter how much you praise Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, his praiseworthiness, al Hamid, this is beyond our comprehension. But what's amazing is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave humanity, His Khalifa on the earth, the words by which we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these words are Allah's words that He gave to His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And His Rasul taught it to you and me. And had these words come down upon a mountain, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the mountain would have crumbled to dust because the rest of the creation cannot handle this. This is, this is too much. But the heart of the human being is able to contain these words. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us to say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And He told us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a hadith, that every time a person, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the salah is between me and my servant, divided in two parts. Whenever my servant says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah, He responds. Imagine all the angels are saying, Ya Allah, we could never praise You the way You deserve it. This one human being, he stands up, Allahu Akbar, his wudu is half done, not even proper wudu, he's half asleep, you know, and he stands up, he's thinking about other things, and he says, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And Allah, the owner of the mighty throne, he responds, my servant, you have praised me. Angels say, we couldn't praise you. This guy says, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, not even thinking about what he's saying. Allah says, you have praised me. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, you have recognized me. They have recognized me. Malik Yawmuddin, you have honored me. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'in. Whatever you want, my servant asks and I give it to you. And then we say, Ihdina salat al mustaqim What's amazing about this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is highlighting for us the honor He gave to humanity. The honor of human being, the Bani Adam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا Bani Adam. We have honored the children of Adam. So inherently, in every single human being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed a dignity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed an honor that the entire, the rest of the creation, they look and marvel at this human creation. And, and this is talking about you and me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made your nafs something that is so precious and so mighty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by it in the Quran. Wa nafsin wa ma sawaha. Allah, He swears by the nafs and the one who shaped it, who fashioned it, who made it the way it is. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made your nafs so precious that when you oppress your nafs, He comes to your defense. Allah says, He entered His garden and He was an oppressor over His nafs. Allah didn't like that the person was oppressing His nafs. Why? 
Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made you, and He designed you and He fashioned you, this is His work. This is His design. This is the expression of His creativity. And so you are a masterpiece of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, each and every single person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored you, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated you, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made you capable of praising Him. And that nafs with all its bad qualities, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told us, never say my nafs is khabif. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He said, never say my nafs is khabif. You can, khabif means something filthy, something evil. Never say that, he said sallallahu alayhi wa You can say my nafs is lazy. My nafs is, uh, likes coffee too much, likes too much video games. Yes, there's all these faults and all these flaws, but never say it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that it's something evil. Right? And so our ulama, they said, it's very important for a person to come to know who he is. Because there's a very famous proverb that said, whoever knows himself knows his Lord. Whoever knows himself knows his Lord. And that means that our scholars have said, self-knowledge is the beginning place of coming to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He shows His signs. And His signs are in the horizons and where? سَنُورِهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ Allah shows His signs in the horizons, in the creation outside of you, but also within you, inside your nafs. Inside your nafs is a place in which Allah's signs are being shown. And so our ulama they said, the human being that has been placed in between, in the isthmus, in the meeting place of two separate worlds. One is the world of material existence. So when you go out into the world, you have this jism, you have this body, and you interact with this material world. But the other is the spiritual reality. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَنَفَخَ فِي آدَمْ مِنْ رُوحِي He breathed into Adam from his spirit, from his ruh. And so the internal reality of the human being has that ruh, that spiritual reality. And this has openings into the realm of you know, ma'ani, the realm of meanings and the realm of understanding and the higher realms and things that you cannot measure, you cannot understand, you cannot have a scientific method to say, oh, now we understand what consciousness is. You can never get grasp it or, or, or encompass it. This is something purely understood experientially by the heart. And so ulama they said, when you're in place of these two separate worlds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then He gives an example. He says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ from his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth. And the differences between your tongues and your colors. And so our ulama said, what's interesting here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pointing out something amazing. The difference between the skies and the earth, these are both signs of Allah. Our scholars have said, whenever Allah is talking about the skies, He's talking about higher realities. Higher realities. Whenever he's talking about the earth, he's talking about the lower realities. And they're both signs from Allah. And there is a part of you that's created from the earth. So your body, the color of your skin, the, the stature that you have, your muscles, your bones, the blood flowing through your veins, these are all your earthly qualities. And they don't make much of a difference. You know, you cut everybody, they bleed. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the difference in your colors is a sign that's related to your earthly uh, reality. And then the difference in your tongues, how you process language, how you understand meaning. And this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to Adam alayhi salam. وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ أَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا He taught Adam alayhi salam the names of all things. And so our scholars have said then, that's the entryway into the world that is within you. If you want to understand the signs of Allah inside you, you have to understand the world of meanings, the world of symbols, the world in which tangible things are, are, are felt inside your heart. They're not something you hold in your hand. And Iman resides in the heart. Taqwa resides in the heart. Happiness is felt in the heart. All of these things that, that people seek, they want to find peace. So somebody goes out and they earn money. Somebody goes out and they look for a relationship and all these things. They're looking for something outside. But the reality is experienced where? In your heart. And so we have a story from Mullah Nasruddin traditions. One time he said he was inside his house sewing something with his needle and he dropped his needle. 
And it was past Maghrib time, he didn't have a lamp, so the, the house was pretty dark. He tried to find it, he couldn't find it. So he opened the window, he looked outside, he found a, a lamp post in, in, in some distance away from his house. So he walked over to the lamp post and he started groping around under the light there. So his neighbor walking by said, Mullah, what are you doing? He said, I, I dropped something, I'm just looking for it. He said, oh, okay, let me help you, what are neighbors for? So they start looking and they start groping around the floor together for about half an hour. Finally, the neighbor got frustrated and fed up and said, Mullah, what did you lose? He said, something very small as a, as a needle, like, you know, where did you drop it? He said, I dropped it inside my house. He said, I lost it inside the house. So why are we looking for it out here? Why are you looking for it out here? He said, because it's brighter out here. Right? And so, the thing with the difference with the reality of the physical and the spiritual is that the physical senses that you have, they're more overpowering than the spiritual senses. They're more latif, they're more subtle. And so the physical senses, you look out, you see vibrant colors, you hear sounds, right, that, are, that, are, that just get your attention. And your name is also a sound. You know, and the language you speak are, are sounds. You know, I'm just making vibrations with my tongue. And somehow you're able to read my mind. Allahu Akbar. Right, and so, so the physical realm, the physical experience is so overwhelming that people get lost in this. And they start to look for whatever they're looking for in the physical reality. And then they think their satisfaction comes from here. They think their, their fulfillment comes from here. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانِ Oh human being, remember. Everything here is going to disappear. This physical experience, this is very temporary reality. It's a very small blip in your total existence. You are a soul that used to exist in the knowledge of Allah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought you into the, the spiritual form in which you are in. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told us, Allah, He pulled out of Adam alayhi wa all of his descendants. You were there, I was there, Biden was there, everybody was there. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked them a question. Am I not your Lord? Do you not see that reality? Do you not witness that reality? They said, Bala shahidna. Yes, we see it. We witness. So you were in the presence of Allah before you even came into this world. And then what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Don't say, I didn't know about this. When the day of meeting comes again, don't say, I didn't know about this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed His reality to you. So the heart, the qalb, our scholar said there's a, there's a science in the Arabic language, you can flip the letters and there's a meaning that's, that they're connected. For example, you can have ilm and you flip the letters, you get amal. means knowledge and action, they're related. And they said qalb also related with qabla, something that came before. So the heart has knowledge that came from before. And that's why even the psychologists today, they're saying it's hardwired into the person to recognize beauty. It's hardwired. I had one time I had one of my shaykhs, may Allah have mercy on him. He asked me, I, you know, I used to contemplate and think, so I asked him, Shaykh, what is beauty? He said, you're a very clever person, Shwai. You're going to say, you, you ask yourself this question, what is beauty? And then see what answers come. He said, whatever answer comes, ignore it and ask it again. So I go to the park, sit on a bench, look at a lake and do it. I said, okay. So I went out, sat down, looking at the lake, I said, what is beauty? And of course, as my, the Shaykh told me, the answers start coming. Beauty is something pleasing to the eyes. Aesthetically beautiful. Has vibrant colors. Has, has an arrangement of patterns or whatever. No, no, no. What is beauty? Beauty is something that, that delights a person when they experience it. No, no. What is beauty? And I kept asking until what he said happened. What is beauty? No answer. I'm just looking out at the lake and I see the, the water is rippling. And you see the bird in the distance, the trees, and, and they're all moving slightly. It's so, Allahu Akbar. You don't need to have words to describe something. You can feel it here. And beauty is an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Jameel. Yuhibbu Jamal. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. And how do you know beauty? You recognize it here. You feel it. And sometimes you can feel it in your relationship with your family members. You kiss your child, you feel this. Right? And it's not the, 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 the actions out of love, it's not this is the reality that's experienced and tasted inside. And so Abu Namadi said, when you 
delve into this ma'ani, you find that the nafs is actually a place upon which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is revealing His names and attributes. And you start to experience this closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that closeness is a reality that cannot be disputed. He says in the Quran, وَهُوَ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْمُرِيدِ He's closer to you than the jugular or the artery that's, that's in your neck. That the connection between your heart and your brain, what makes you alive, what makes you conscious, Allah is closer to you than yourself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and He comes between a man and his heart. And some people, they, 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 they read these ayat and they say, Oh no man, Allah is watching me, Allah is looking at me, Allah is going to punish me for everything I did. No! What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you is that this hablu al-wareed that's sustaining you, that's giving you life, your physical existence depends on it. You cut this, you die. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more fundamental to your existence than that thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is closer to you than your life. Allahu Akbar. And as you, as you feel that, you start to become more and more sensitive to the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people, Allah can show them the greatest signs, but because they have some problem in here, they don't see it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, one of the problems that Allah will avert His signs from you is if you have kibr in your heart. Somebody has kibr, they don't, look, they don't witness Allah's signs. Fir'aun, Allah showed him so many signs. The sea split open in front of his eyes. Frogs and locusts and all these things start happening. What did he see? He said, there is Bani Israel, let's go get them. And he went after them. The sea is splitting open. He didn't see that. Allah Akbar. But when the heart starts to get purified, and you know, know this and recognize the arrogance, and you start to polish it and remove it, then what happens? The, the, you don't need major signs. You know, somebody says, I recognize Allah is real when I had a car accident and nothing happened to me. Yeah, that's a huge event, right? That's a huge event, but obviously it's going to get your attention. Somebody else says, I have started feeling Allah's presence. I start feeling this connection. When I saw my wife give birth for the first time, I think you see new life come into this world. Allah Akbar. Again, it's a big event. You know, somebody else, as they get more and more sensitive, they come out of their house, and there's a, there's a plant growing in front of their house, and there's a beautiful red flower. Wallahi, it's there on purpose. It's there on purpose so that that person can look at that flower and say, Allah, Allah. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, the end of time will not come as long as there is one person left on the earth who says, Allah, Allah. Right? All it needs one person to recognize the presence of Allah and mention His name, it sustains the entire universe. Allah, Allah, Allah. And so, so our ulama, they said, all the prophets that Allah sent, their main job was to call people to Allah and to fix that relationship between them because shaitan, what he wants to do is come between you and your beloved. That's the goal of shaitan. Shaitan wants to make you commit fawahish. He wants you to do munkar. He wants you to say about Allah things you have no knowledge about. And taqulu ala Allahi ma la ta'lam. To say about Allah what you don't know. And on shaitan, he makes some promises. As shaitan, يَعِذَكُمْ بِالْفَقْرِ وَيَعْمُرُكُمْ بِالْفَحْشَةِ Right, shaitan, he threatens you with poverty. Means, this physical life that you have, shaitan will say, look, how are you going to make the bills? How is this going to happen? How is that going to happen? What is he trying to shake? Your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah is not going to take care of you. And some people think that way. That I need to do something because Allah is not going to take care of me. Right? So they're in the state of anxiety and worry and fear. And shaitan will also command you to do shameless things. So first he makes you try to lose hope in Allah. And second thing, he tries to make you lose hope in yourself, in your nafs. So you see how corrupt yourself is. You say, man, I say I'm a Muslim, but look at all the, the sins that I have. Look at all the things that I'm doing. So you start to lose hope in yourself and you stop turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah says, okay, this is shaitan's game. Here's what Allah promises you. Allah, He promises you maghfira, forgiveness from Himself. You know, and He forgives you fadl. And He, forgive, he, he promises you his, his bounty. So when He threatens you with poverty, Allah, He promises you bounty. You will not go hungry, not a single day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's al-Razzaq, and He has promised and He's guaranteed your risk will be taken care of. 
So don't worry about it. What is yours, nobody can take it from you. What is written for you? In the sky, whatever is written, it's all written for you there. And whatever you're seeking, it's all written, it's guaranteed. It's far beneath Allah's generosity that a servant wants something and Allah will not give it to him. And the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told us, Allah will fulfill every dua of Bani Adam as long as they don't get hasty. And they said, how do we get hasty, Ya Rasulullah? He said, the person will say, I asked Allah for something again and again, and Allah didn't give it to me. So they lose hope, so they stop making dua. Right, so every time shaitan threatens you with poverty, Allah says, don't worry, you have my father with you. Every time shaitan commands you to shameless things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't worry, you have my mother with you. Allahu Akbar. And what's greater than Allah's mercy? What's greater than Allah's forgiveness? And see, here's the thing. Before you commit a sin, before you do something bad, shaitan humiles you up. He says, it's okay. He reminds you of Allah's mercy. He says, Allah's merciful. Allah will forgive you. Just do it. Don't worry about it. You know, everything's going to be okay. And He tempts you and He pushes you and pushes you until you get to that act. And while Shaitan is pushing you, you know what Allah is doing? That heart that has illumination in it, that heart that has Iman in it, the Iman is saying, don't do it, man. That's not right. How are you going to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And He's the Lord of the heavens and the earth. And he's the king that controls everything. All the heavens and the earth, it all belongs to him. How are you going to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So your heart is telling you, don't do it. Your nafs is telling you, shaitan is telling you, don't worry, Allah forgives. The moment you commit the act, the moment you fall, the moment you slip, shaitan says, I knew it, you're a hypocrite. How are you going to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you are this kind of person? And shaitan will start threatening you with Allah's fear and, and His jalal and His majesty. While Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's okay, come back to me. And He extends His hand and He embraces you. Right? And so, the reality is, all of these things that appear in the Qur'an, the promise and the threat, our scholars said, the noble, one of Allah's names is Kareem. A Kareem is a person who has nobility. Somebody who has dignity, somebody who has generosity. He said, if a father is Kareem, he will tell his son to do something. And his son will, out of fear and awe of his father's, you know, wakhar, his jalal, the son will be afraid to disobey the father. But if he falls short, the father gave him some threat. You know, if you don't do your homework, you don't finish your task, then woe to you, you're going to get it from me. Somebody's going to get hurt, right? And what happens? The son is afraid. He doesn't want to mess up, but he messes up. Then what? The father is going to beat him, kick him out of the house. What's he going to do? He says, it's okay, my son. It's all right. Next time, do better. And, 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 and this is the relationship of love. And so our ulama, they said, when you become more and more sensitive to the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the type of relationship you have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts to evolve and change. Uh, Isa alayhi salam, he was walking by a group of people. He saw them with, with their skins, you know, shriveled up, you know, very, very scared people. He asked them, who are you people? They said, we are Ibadullah. Allah has scared us with his Jahannam. And so we don't want to go to Jahannam, we're worshiping him. And they're in a state of fear and anxiety. He, he said, you are afraid of something that's been created. You're scared of something that is a creation of Allah. So he left him alone. It's not a bad thing. وَمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ Jannatan. If somebody's scared of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah gives them two jannahs. Don't worry about it. Then he kept on going. He saw another group of people making dhikr of Allah, worshipping. They look more cheerful, more happy. He said, who are you people? They said, we are a people whom Allah has enticed us with his jannah. We want his mercy. We want to go to jannah. Allahu Akbar. He said, you have desired something that is created. He left him alone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us with Jannah in the Quran. You know, he told us about Hurrain and all these different things. So if you want that, work towards it. Some people, this will not work for them. They have to be scared. You can tell them about Jannah all you want. They're going to commit ma'asi and sins and everything. They say, Allah forgives. No, you tell them about Jahannam. Okay, I need to get my act together. Right? So, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used both methods and both of them is from His mercy. 
so that you can come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Isa alayhi salam, he kept on going, he saw another group of people and they were enraptured. They were in a state of ecstasy. He said, who are you people? They said, we are lovers of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made himself known to us and we have fallen in love with him. So we worship him because we love him. He said, you are the ones. And he sat with them and he made dhikr with them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Kaf, وَاسْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيمِ يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَ Keep yourself busy and keep yourself patient with those who are calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day and night. And what do they want? They don't want Jannah, they don't want this, they don't want, they want Allah's face. يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَ They want to witness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They want to have that reality. They want to be in His presence. This is all they want. And then there's examples of them in Surah, surah Insan. They go and they, they spend from their wealth and they feed the people. And they say, you know, when people attempt to thank them or feel they're indebted to them, they say, no, don't worry about it. We're not doing this so that you could, you could thank us or something. We're doing this for the face of Allah. The wajhillah. And so our ulama, they said, this relationship, it comes only when you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, you will seek His creation, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just the degrees. And Musa السلام, the most beloved of Allah, one time he got up and said, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, show me your face that I may look at you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa السلام, Oh Musa, you cannot see with these eyes. Right? Your physical reality cannot handle the spiritual vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's reality, 70,000 veils. And what's amazing is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Qadir, He had veiled you from Himself by something that has no existence beside Him. Allahu Akbar. And it's not Allah who's veiled, you are veiled. Right? So Musa alayhi wa sallam was told, you cannot handle it. And Musa alayhi salam, you know, when you love somebody, you're able to, like a, a child to their father, please, please, you know. So Musa alayhi salam, he does that, please, yeah, Allah just said. So Allah said, okay, Musa, I'm going to remove one of the veils, and I'm going to shine some of my light on the mountain. If the mountain can handle it, no problem, I'll show you. So Musa alayhi salam, intently watching the mountain, intently, and he sees the mountain crumble to dust. Allahu Akbar. The mountain crumbles to dust, Musa alayhi salam, he faints. And when he comes back to his senses, he says, Ya Allah, forgive me for asking about something I have no knowledge about. Our ulama, they said, a person who wants to experience Allah's reality, is like an ant that comes to the ocean and he wants to drink the whole ocean. Allahu Akbar. But you can't. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does out of his mercy, he exposes very slowly with, with look. Allah is completely dominant over your affairs. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is latif. He is latif. And so very subtly, very subtly, He starts to show you more and more signs until as you age and you get closer to the moment of meeting and you have iman in your heart, Allahu Akbar. You long for that. You look forward to meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the end of Surah Al-Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ And whoever hopes and desires to meet their Lord, what do you do? فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا Continue doing the good that you're doing. Don't count on your good deeds. Count on Allah's mercy. But continue doing the good that you're doing. وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا And don't make any shirk with your worship of Allah, anything. And our ulama, they said, Jannah is part of Ahada. No, hellfire is part of Ahada. Your A'mal is part of the Ahada. So, so whatever you do, don't depend on anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will have that liqa that you're looking for. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the risk of looking at Him on the day of judgment in Jannah. Ameen, ya Rabbul Alameen. Aquli qawli hadha, astaghfirullah lakum, fastaghfiru, inna huwa huwa ghafoor al الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم he was telling the Sahaba about this glorious meeting. He said in Jannah you'll be able to see Allah. 
They said, Ya Rasulullah, can we really see Allah? Is it really possible? Prophet said, do you have any problem seeing the sun in a clear day? They said, no. So do you have any problem seeing the full moon in a clear night? They said, no. He said, you will be able to witness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more clear than that. Allahu Akbar. And so, so what we have to understand, what we have to understand, I'm going to conclude with this, is that everything belongs to Allah. There's a king. He had four wives. And he had more love for one of his wives over the others. So the others, naturally, they got jealous. They said, okay, what's she got that we don't have? You know, we have better style than her. We have better, you know, attitude than her. All that stuff. The king said, don't worry, I'll, I'll show you. So he filled up his treasure house. He opened the doors and he called his wives. He said, this is a day of increase. This is a day I'm going to give you gifts. He said, come. So he brought his wives and they're like the door of this treasure house and they see all the marvels in front of their eyes. Imagine somebody takes you to the mall and gives you a card and says, whatever you want. Allahu Akbar. Right? So they're all excited. They said, this is amazing. So the king says, whatever you put your hands on is yours. Go and get it. So the three wives that he loved, you know, that, that were jealous, they ran, they ran. One of them grabbed a box of gold, another one grabbed something, another one grabbed something. And, and they noticed the wife that he loves the most, she's just standing there. And she's very shy. So they said, see, she doesn't even know what she wants. Why do you like her more? So she said, can I really have anything I put my hands on? The king said, of course. And in her wisdom, she placed her hands on the shoulder of the king. You have the king. All that treasure belongs to who? The king. So you can run after the king all you after the treasures all you want. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuha al-insan. Oh my God. Ma gharruka bi rabbika al-kareem. Oh Allah akbar. So seek the king. And you'll have all his treasures. It's all for you anyway. Inna khalaqna lakum ma fi al-ardi. Jami'ah. He says, I created everything on the earth for you. Allah akbar. So we conclude with this. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase our iman. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to make us amongst His beloved and grant us His love. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make His love more beloved to us than our, our families, our deen, our, 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 our livelihood, everything, our family. You know? And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all of our shortcomings, all of our sins, and make us of those who, who come on the Day of Judgment under the shade of His throne, amongst those who love one another for His sake, who stand with each other for His sake, who spend on each other for His sake. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enter all of us into the highest levels of Jannah and protect us from the hellfire. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam, 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 wa alayhi wa